Papyrus is a grassy reed that grows along the banks of the Nile in Egypt. It can grow up to 5 meters tall and 8 centimeters thick. The tough outer rind is peeled away. The inner pith is peeled or sliced into strips. The strips are laid out in two layers in a grid pattern. They are pressed together until the layers merge, like Velcro, and then left out in the sun to dry, where they turn light brown. The resulting sheets, called Kalamata, are smoothed out with an ivory or seashell ruler. The Kalamata are then glued together with a paste made of flour and water. Then the areas where they are joined are hammered smooth. This forms a long piece of papyrus, usually 5 to 10 meters, comprised of up to 20 kalamata. The papyrus is rolled up around a dowel called an umbilicus. Portions of it are unrolled for writing. The first section, called the protocolon, is usually left blank. The ink seeps into the papyrus, filling in empty spaces between the fibers and changing the pattern of the surface. This can be seen here in a close-up. The papyri are stored on shelves in a library in Herculaneum. One day, Mount Vesuvius erupts. A surge of hot gas and mud from the volcano fills the room. The papyrus scrolls are deformed by the force of the mud, and they are carbonized in the heat. They shrink as they are carbonized. They blister in the heat. Some of the layers will fray apart internally, and they become fragile and thinner. Under more than 20 meters of mud, the scrolls are damaged but remain preserved. The ink is still present on the papyrus, even throughout the centuries that follow. Seventeen hundred years later, a farmer digging a well strikes a beautiful mosaic floor. Tunnels are dug through the villa, and the carbonized papyri are found and recovered. Hundreds of years later, we are now almost able to read them, for which we need your help. Virtual Unwrapping was born from a vision that I had where we might be able to explore the interior of something without having to actually physically open it. And so how to do that was really a software problem once you take an image that goes all the way through the middle of something, like an x-ray. And the Virtual Unwrapping concept came from the software that would allow you to take that scan, that x-ray that goes all the way through, and look at it and unwrap it and unfold it without ever having to do that to the real object. The scroll from En Gedi came to us with almost no effort on our part. It was a real miracle because I'd worked so hard to try to get access to various objects that I thought were interesting. And through my own research, I would try to assess what might be interesting and what wasn't. But the scroll from En Gedi, I didn't even know it existed. It was written uh, with ink that has some metal in it. And it was also written on animal skin rather than papyrus. So the layers were a little bit more clear to be able to see when we did the scan. and the ink showed up much more readily than other kinds of ink.
What we didn't realize at the time was that the papyrus from the ancient world was going to be much more challenging than the animal skin from the uh, Dead Sea Scroll collection, just in terms of the technology. That turned out to be a, a huge challenge that, uh, that stalled us for a while, and then we became reinvigorated because of the success of the scroll from En Gedi. The scrolls from Herculaneum were not excavated in a way where they were pristine. I wish that were true, but in fact, had they been perfectly preserved, they might not have survived. The irony there is that the volcanic eruption that carbonized them, which is to say made them like charcoal, probably also saved them. It's just that now when, when they're pulled out from that 50 meters worth of dirt and they've been crushed and they've been carbonized, um, it, it's an extremely difficult technical challenge to then figure out how to actually read them. The first thing we tackled was, um, was something that was really commonly misunderstood, and that is that it would be impossible using x-ray to see ink that is of the chemistry of the Herculaneum ink. We put the ink from Herculaneum, uh, an approximation, on examples that we could scan and then observe. And what we found is that the conventional wisdom was absolutely wrong. In fact, it was possible to see that carbon ink in the scans, but there were caveats. There were caveats like we needed more precision, we needed to be a little bit more meticulous in how we captured the data so that we would be able to see a very subtle layer of that carbon on the papyrus. And in 2016-17, there were some stunning developments in the AI community that were released and um, inspired us to give those methods a try at detecting these signals. And it all came together in 2019 when at the particle accelerator, we were able to collect some uh, outstanding data from Herculaneum material. What the Vesuvius Challenge, which is a competitive uh, prize, allowed us to do was to enlist over a thousand research teams to work on a problem that normally we would only have five people working on. And those people working on that problem for three months, I estimate they probably spent 10 person years and probably two compute years over those three months working just on the problem of Herculaneum Inc. So it's kind of fascinating to think about um, that avenue the competitive science, the prize-based avenue of, of helping accelerate research. And uh, so far, we've been really successful at seeing progress through that, through that challenge. Probably in the 20th century, the biggest uh, revelation of, of text from the ancient world was the Dead Sea Scroll Collection from the 1940s and 50s. Uh, I think revealing Herculaneum with the size of that corpus in the 21st century would, would be the biggest discovery from the ancient world. I think there's a huge uh, emotional component to that that is, is powerful and also um, can really inspire people to uh, not only learn and apply the science, but um, understand us a little bit better and understand our history. And so uh, I've become really fascinated and intrigued by what heritage science is going to do um, in, the, in the coming decades. And you know, if I can play a role here at UK in uh, in bringing that to students and also bringing that programmatically to what we do, uh, that's what I want to do. I did research with Dr. Seals as an undergraduate and then after I graduated moved to Seattle and worked at Microsoft for a year. I ended up doing some work initially 
part-time and possibly short-term with Dr. Seals, just rejoining his research team, giving me a place to land, and I ended up finding, I once again was compelled by the work, so I stuck around. My time at UK as an undergraduate helped prepare me in a lot of ways. I really liked how many different opportunities there were at a large university, so I was able to find all these ways to make the experience feel small to me and personal. So I knew early on I wanted to apply computer science to something. I didn't know what yet, and that gave me an opportunity to think about that and start thinking about those questions. Dr. Seals' lab has been amazing. He's spent 20 years building research partnerships across the world, so we have amazing opportunities, and I've been really fortunate as a graduate student to work with the Institut de France and the National Library in Naples and go to Oxford and all these amazing places. I mean, to have access to that sort of material and those people has been amazing. My work as a researcher on the Digital Restoration Initiative has been as a computer scientist. My role is to try to develop technical methods that help us essentially read more of these materials and uncover uh, more of these texts. I got really captured by the Herculaneum scrolls and so I spend a lot of time working on those in particular. What that often means is writing software or algorithms that process basically x-ray CT images of scrolls where I'm trying to make text show up and to virtually unwrap them. The Herculaneum scrolls in particular are basically the most challenging they could be in every way, technically. It's kind of amazing that this is even maybe possible. I've had the opportunity to be the first person to see some text that's been hidden for, in the case of these scrolls, 2,000 years. And a human hand wrote this uh, at least that long ago, and no one has seen it since then. And then I see it either sitting at my desk or in one instance on my couch at home. It shows up, you know, I look at the results of one of my experiments, and there it is. So far, two Greek characters. It's the first two that we've gotten after many years of working on this research problem. And actually they look like the letters H-I in English. It looks like it says hi. It's written in Greek, so it's not, it doesn't literally say hi. But visually it looks like it says hi, which I think is hilarious. That, uh, you know, we've worked on this for so long and that's the first message we get is someone saying hi from 2,000 years ago. The Vesuvius Challenge is a unique opportunity. Thanks to Nat Friedman, Daniel Gross, and some others who came to us with the idea and they had developed an interest in this work and were interested in helping us accelerate it. We released a lot of our code and methods, so we made those open source and we invited people to build on them and contribute. First of all, to test and sort of reproduce and verify our results, to confirm that our findings are accurate, that there is indeed ink in these CT scans, and then to help us move it forward. It's been amazing for me to be able to work with Dr. Seals and his research team. He's supported me to pursue this research problem pretty openly, which I think is, is hard to do at times. He's allowed me to chase whatever direction I felt I needed to pursue on the technical side, and then he's enabled this work, so he's put a lot of his time and effort over a period of decades to make this work possible at all. He's a, an important personal mentor to me, and yeah, we'll be, we'll be close for a long time. Machine learning generally, the last year or two have been hard to believe. The pace has been absurd. Things are moving really quickly. I think we're seeing across the board that a lot more is possible than we thought and that it might happen sooner than we thought. And it's on the threshold of being possible in so many ways that it's kind of a miracle that this is doable and that we all believe this is possible. And then yet yeah, to reveal the text to the world, that would be amazing. Hello everyone, 
on behalf of the Stanley and Karen Pigman College of Engineering here at the University of Kentucky, I want to welcome you today for a very exciting announcement that we have to make. Um, my name is Christy Chapman. I am the Research and Partnership Director for Dr. Seals Research Team. And I have with me a group of folks that we're going to hear from today and that I'm going to introduce really quickly. First to my right is J.P. Posma. He is the um, technical lead, project lead for the Vesuvius Challenge, which we're going to be hearing more about. We have Luke Ferreter, who is one of the contestants um, from the challenge or in the challenge. I have Federica Nicolardi, who is assistant professor of paparology at the University of Naples, Federico Secondo. Um, and finally, we have the esteemed uh, Stanley and Karen Pigman, endowed professor of heritage science from the Department of Computer Science, Dr. Prof uh, Brent Seals. So thank you guys all for being here. Thank you to our local audience and our live stream audience. So JP, I'm just gonna start with you. Um, let's talk first about the Vesuvius Challenge. Why don't you tell us what it is, how it came about, what the, what the details are. Oh, great. Yeah, so you've probably at this point, if you're watching the live stream, heard about it. Uh, but to, just to give a little bit of background, I'm representing here uh, really on behalf of uh, uh, Nat Friedman, who's really the instigator of the whole thing. Um, so the Vesuvius Challenge really is, um, it's, it's a, a competition uh, instigated by, by Nat and with uh, private donors. And really our goal is, we just want to read these scrolls. Right, so we have the Herculaneum papyri, uh, which we just heard uh, a lot about, um, and we, uh, we just want to read them. And so we are organizing this competition to, uh, with a grand prize. Um, we have more than $1,000 in uh, prizes total. A million. Uh, million dollars, sorry. <laughs> Big difference there. A thousand, thousand dollars in prizes with a grand prize being $700,000 and then a bunch of uh, smaller prizes to encourage progress uh, along the way. Um, so what's been the response? Have you had any takers? You have how many contestants? Yeah, so the response has been pretty incredible, actually. Um, we've had sort of on and off uh, for the different uh, surprises, uh, different groups of people uh, coming to the fore. Um, I think the biggest group that we had was for the ink detection uh, challenge, um, where we had uh, I think more than 500 teams that actually beat the baseline that we had set uh, originally, and I think maybe like 1,200 teams in total, which is just incredible. Yeah, we see here you have almost 1,500 uh, members on your Discord channel, so yeah. that tells you how much engagement, yeah, you actually yeah. have. So you mentioned the first letters, or not first letters, you mentioned the Kaggle competition, so yeah. there have been some interim prizes, so yes. tell us a little bit about the prizes um, that you've given out so far. and. Um, yeah, so we've had several um, prizes. Um, there's, there's kind of two tracks. There's segmentation, which is really about mapping out the, uh, the 3D structure of the scrolls. So where are the sheets of papyrus? And then today what we'll be looking at the most is um, uh, what's called ink detection. So once you have these sheets of papyrus sort of inside the scrolls, um, inside this uh, CT scan X-ray volume, um, you want to actually read what's on there. And the problem with these CT scans is that uh, you don't really see the ink um, directly on the CT scan, but there's a lot of indication um, from years of work by uh, Dr. Seals' team um, that there should be a method. Uh, there have been sort of early signs of machine learning that have um, shown that it should be possible. And so ink detection really is the problem of like how do you take that CT data combined with like the, the 3D structure and start revealing some actual text. So yeah, I see here, for example, that uh, there was a $45,000 segmentation tooling prize recently given. So do you have a prize to award today? Yes, so this is what we're all here for today. Um, we have a prize called the First Letters Prize, which we set up a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, basically after that first iteration of ink detection prizes. Um, and the criteria for the first letters prize is you have to find at least 10 letters, legible letters, uh, as reviewed by our team of paparologists uh, in a four square centimeter region. So that's 
about this big, pretty pretty small region. But you know, they they wrote pretty small. You know, papyrus is expensive, so um, and so. We have a winner for that uh, for that prize today. So, do you want to give him its prize? Let's do All it. Right. So here we have Luke Ferreter, who is winning the first lettuce prize on behalf of the Vesuvius Challenge. Indeed, thank you. Thank you so much for your incredible yeah. achievement. Awesome, yeah. Sure. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so, Luke, can we take a look at what you found? Yeah, right absolutely. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so how does this feel? I mean, you've revealed text for the first time from something that was written 2,000 years ago. You were the first person to see these characters since the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. So what did you do when you first saw this on your computer screen? And where were you? What happened? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a funny story. I've been working on this challenge for a very long time since it basically launched. And um, you know, one night, late Saturday night, I was actually at a party. It's, it's funny. And I got a text from someone else on the Vesuvius Challenge team. And they said, hey, we've just uploaded this new flattened piece of papyrus. Seems kind of interesting. It's got these patterns that we've been talking about. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, I pull out my little phone. You know, imagine music blaring. I'm just sitting in the corner, right? And I type in, you know, please run your, you know, please run the algorithm on this new flattened piece. And I just, you know, turn off my phone. Don't think about it. But then I'm walking home. You know, again, this is 1 a.m. late at night, and I pull out my phone and I see these letters. Not as clear, but I saw these letters, and uh, it was. I just completely freaked out. You know, I, I freaked out. I. You know, almost fell over, almost cried. I took a screenshot, you know, I immediately sent it to JP, who sent it to everyone else. I sent it to my family. My mom called, she's like, hey, like, this, this is the first thing you've sent me that really looks like letters. Like, this is really cool. Um, and at that point, I was just like, man, like, let's improve this. Let's, you know, keep going until I got to something that uh, looks a lot like the image you're seeing today. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. I mean, obviously, you must have a PhD, right? Because this is a very accomplished uh, feat that you have achieved. Uh, yeah, I'm actually an undergraduate at the University of Nebraska. I'm 21 years old. So, <laughs> yeah, I've Can been we have our guest? Thank world. you very much. So what else do you do in your spare time, assuming you have spare time? I mean, we heard you go to parties, but you're still checking on your uh, contest work. So what else do you like to do? Or? Yeah, I, I try to stay active with uh, the Vesuvius stuff. But for the, kind of the first part of the challenge uh, through July, I was interning at SpaceX and just kind of doing this in the evenings and weekends. Um, I try to work on other projects, too, and you know, do school and, and sometimes go to parties. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just an intermediate prize again. Uh, JP mentioned the grand prize. Um, what do you think about that? Are you going to go after the grand prize? I mean, what do you think you need to do to win, and do you think you can really do it? I, I absolutely think it's doable. You know, you look at this image, you can see a bunch of other letters peeking out. These ones with the boxes are ones we've kind of really confirmed. Um, so you just got to take this, iterate, work really hard, lots of experiments. I think it's very, very doable. There was also a second place winner, right, JP, in the first letter prize? Um, this yeah. is him. You want to tell us about Yousef? Yeah, so a little after um, Luke made his first, first submission, and we were still you know, working with a paparologist to, to validate it, really make sure it's legit. We did this whole technical review. So all of this takes a little bit of time. And suddenly, Youssef, who um, uh, we first heard about when he actually won uh, a smaller prize uh, um, a month ago or so, uh, actually for a technique that he ended up using for this prize, um, he made a submission of the same area, um, <laughs> believe it or not. And it was even clearer uh, than Luke's. Um, and so, uh, we are very delighted to uh, award him the second place prize uh, to the first lettuce prize. Um, yeah, because first place is first person. Yeah, it's yep. the first person. It's, it's like the first letter. So you gotta it. you gotta get get in there. But there was always uh, a plan to have the second prize. Yeah, and then the second the second prize uh, was for the the person who would uh, who made made the, make the discovery um, after the first one, and so um, you you did. Yeah, so unfortunately, Yusuf uh, couldn't be here because he's actually in Germany right now. But I think we have a special message from him yes. that we're going to hear. Yeah, let's roll that. Hello, everyone. I'm Yusuf Nether, and I'm really happy to accept this first letter's prize. 
this past month has been really incredible working on this and from the first moment the letters showed up it has been amazing um, working with everyone on on the project and uh, getting this far i'm really excited for what's in store and uh, i can't wait to work more on this so hopefully you'll be seeing uh, more great results soon thank you so dr seals now to you how do you feel when you see this? I mean, I looked back at you yesterday. You've had a two-day symposium talking about the project. I looked back at you yesterday when Federica was explicating some of the images, and I think I saw you getting a little emotional, maybe. There, there was there's some emotion, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, it's exciting to see an undergraduate competing. We love undergraduate education here at the University of Kentucky. I have my own undergraduates in the lab here, so that's an inspiration. I'm also sitting next to one of the world's eminent paparologists who's going to read for us in a minute something that people said you would never be able to read because it's too hard to extract the text. And yet today we're talking about that exactly that. So let's go back a bit. Um, these scrolls are from an ancient library like we've said 2,000 years ago. They were excavated some 250 years ago. And a few were physically opened with somewhat disastrous results. But these are actually still, still closed up. So you thought you could actually use technology to read these even though they, they can't be opened. I have a picture here of what some of those look like. So when you go to a collection like this, so iconic, uh, on the Bay of Naples, so you look across at Vesuvius and then you see this material, you, you, you have one of two feelings. One is run away because <laughs> it's just too scary and hard. And the other is to put on the lenses right, of a problem solver, the lenses of an engineer, of a computer scientist. When I looked at that material, what I thought is, how can we solve this problem? So when did you first try? In 2005, when that picture was taken, we, uh, we were trying to get access. It took us until 2009 uh, to be able to be ready to be able to take our first images of a scroll. And that happened in partnership with the Institut de France in Paris. And this picture shows one of the scrolls that they have from Herculaneum in their collection. OK, and this is another one, right? This was one of the iconic photographs that we took when we were there in 2009. And um, that's a photograph of the exterior of the scroll. So you can see exactly what these things look like in close up. But what we were after was the scanning of the interior of the scroll so that we would have a chance at reading the, the letters inside. We brought a, a machine into the library itself. And they graciously partnered with us to allow us to make those scans possible. So are the contestants in the contest, are they using this data from 2009? Well, so what's really interesting is that we collected that data in 2009, but it really wasn't good enough to be able to do with precision what we wanted to do in terms of reading. So in fact, that was a seminal moment in the life of this project because we collected the first data. But it led us to be able to collect the next data, which happened in 2019. We were able to go to a, a uh, National Lab in Britain outside of Oxford and at the Diamond Light Source facility in conjunction with um, the members of the library from Paris, France, we all came together collaboratively and imaged one of their scrolls, actually two of their scrolls, in a high energy physics context. So this doesn't look like that black thing we just saw. So, so what do we see in this picture? What's happening here is that we're, we're uh, fixturing the scroll which is standing on its end inside of that case. The scrolls are very fragile and so to support them as we do the scanning we turn them on end inside a protective case and, um, and that way they are protected because from the, from the x-ray and from any kind of physical jarring. So what exactly has changed since 2009? I mean I know there's been a lot of technological development but this still seems pretty impossible. Uh, even given the advances that we've made in the last 10 years, 10, almost 15 now. The images we were able to collect in 2009 looked like this. They were fuzzy. This is a cross section of the interior of that very scroll. In fact, this is the scroll that uh, we're talking about today. It's the same scroll. Um, in 2019, the data that we collected from the synchrotron outside of Oxford University, uh, the diamond light source, was much more precise. In fact, it, you can see that the sharpness uh, creates a real inspiration when you see it, that, um, that in fact we now have the precision that we need to be able to read the writing. And so 
what do you expect when you when you think about the writing from the ancient world? I mean, did people just write letters? What? That's hard for me to imagine. First of all, the time scale that we're talking about. The first century, the first century was was an amazing uh, point in human history, and we have we have so little of that material. They estimate maybe we have lost ninety or ninety five percent of the written material from antiquity. My expectations were low because I'm a trained as a computer scientist. Um, but as the classicists have educated me, what I expect is uh, writing that expresses what it means to be human. Uh, speaking of love and of war and, and of the things that um, still matter to us because we are human just like they were human. And the gulf that separates us, the 2,000 years, is much more narrow than you might think. So Federica, let's let's this is your turn. Um, so let's go back and we'll talk about the image here. Um, tell us about what you see and how this makes you feel as a papyrologist uh, first, so that we all in the audience know what exactly is a papyrologist. Because I, I can tell you, before I started working on this pro project, I didn't even know a papyrologist was a thing. So tell us what you do, and then we'll talk about what yeah. you see here. So this is amazing, of course, for me. So papyrology is a discipline that requires uh, different skills, different competences, different knowledge, uh, because it requires you to work on uh, ancient artifacts from various points of view. So you have to consider the script, the handwriting, the material artifacts. So you're using uh, paleographical skills, and then you're also looking at the context where the papyrus uh, was found, uh, if you had uh, uh, the chance to do that, if you have the opportunity to know something ab about that context. And then you have to look at the text, read the text, uh, try to understand it, and uh, interpret it, and also comment on that. So you're using different skills, like paleographical skills, but also philological skills, and, and then you have to know a lot about uh, literary texts, of course. In the case uh, here, we're talking about literary papyri, of course. So can you tell us maybe what this says or yeah, tell so, us about it? Uh, here there is, uh, there in, the, in this image, we can see the letters that are more clear in, uh, in uh, this uh, papyrus here in this uh, section, in this fragment. And uh, the most striking word is, of course, the one in the second of the three lines where we see uh, letters highlighted. And this word is very special, actually. Uh, we had the, uh, mm, the luck to find a complete word in here, which is very rare, actually. Uh, we could also uh, have expected to find words like and the, <laughs> you know, that, something like that. Uh, but here we have found the word porfuras. And porfuras uh, is the uh, genitive case of the word porfura, and it can mean uh, like purple dye or even purple clothes. So we don't know the context here, but the very fact that we can read so clearly letters from the inside of, the, of a scroll is really incredible. And we have the potential here uh, to read an unopened scroll. That means uh, an untouched, an intact scroll, a scroll that was not damaged by the opening procedure here. Because the fact with their Canadian papyri is that they, are, uh, they were not only uh, carbonized and destroyed or damaged by the eruption of Mount but also uh, by the different unrolling attempts that came after uh, the discovery of the papyri. So in this case here, the text was very much preserved by uh, the, the intact scroll. So that's very amazing. That's really amazing. So purple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do you think about finding the word purple? I mean, is that a common word that you found so far in other open papyri? or? Yeah, it's not so common, but it's a word, it's a Greek word that we could fi find. Of course, we don't understand the context here for now. I am very confident that we'll, we'll be able to uh, know more about it. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to say why we have this word uh, for well, Do you now, think it's a new text, or do you think it's yeah. probably a copy of something? No, of I would say this is a, a new text, because the, uh, one of the reasons why the Herculaneum collection is so unique and so special is that uh, it preserve, preserves work, uh, works that are not known, not transmitted by the medieval tradition. So uh, this is 
one of the reasons why we are so excited in reading the text uh, here, reading letters from the inside of a scroll, uh, because we know that this text is completely new and unknown. So this is really striking here. Very exciting. Um, so this is a really small amount of words. Um, what do these scrolls usually look like? Like, uh, like, do you expect to have more words than this? Yeah, much more than this <laughs> in, in the whole scroll. I mean, uh, the column width uh, may be not so different, uh, not so far from that, uh, but the total length of a scroll must have been something uh, around uh, 10 meters, 12 meters, perhaps even 15 meters in the Herculaneum collection. So we usually find even big scrolls there. Yeah. I'm going to go back just a second here because I want to talk about the fact that things move really quickly in technology. So this was when, Dr. Seals, and you want to tell us a, a little bit about this for me, Vaughn? Yeah, my, uh, my student now, uh, PhD, uh, Stephen Parsons, defended his thesis in August, and he filed it with the uh, University of Kentucky. So you can now find this thesis as the most definitive uh, com compendium of research on uh, this, this work. Uh, that is currently available. And this is Stephen, and this was done in August. Stephen's here with us today. This was done in August, and then Luke, you submitted your prize, your uh, submission when? I believe early, mid-September uh, or something like that. Okay, so between yeah. August to September. Uh, so obviously things move really fast. AI is, is, a, is, is a super hot uh, tool. So I think maybe, JP, we actually have something even newer that we can show, right? Yeah, so literally just off the presses a few days ago as all the paperologists gathered here, <laughs> literally as they were flying in, uh, Yusuf's model generated this picture. Um, and so imagine the, <laughs> the surprise of everyone when, uh, uh, when they got here. So yeah, tell us about this, Federica. What did you think when you saw this? Yeah, this is crazy, really. Uh, because, so we, we have portions of, so we have four columns that we can see in the whole width, plus we can see something from the end of a column at the very beginning and uh, the beginning of another column at the very end of the, of the image. And this is really nice actually because it allows us to see very clearly the layout of the text, which is also very important when we talk about papyri, when we talk about reconstruction of papyri. And here you can see that the column width is very consistent and the, also the, the, the width of the intercolumnia, so the blank space is uh, between the, the columns, and this is also very interesting. And actually, this new image uh, gave us the chance to uh, read something more and to uh, confirm again uh, the reading that we had from uh, Luke's image, and that's really, really great. And also, we have here some punctuation marks, and this is really exciting because they're not, not uh, Greek characters, so they're not Greek letters, but uh, punctuation marks used by ancient scribes uh, uh, to mark something in the text, to mark a pause in the text. We can see one at the very beginning of the text in the first column between the first and the second line. And this is really, really, really exciting. And everything is completely new here. Let's see, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So um, how long do you think it will take you and your students and uh, Professor Del Mastro, who's here with us today also, to, to tell us what this, this exactly says? So, is there enough here? How confident are you that you can, you'll be able to, to read this? And how confident? We know that you know, de deep fakes are a thing with AI. So how confident <laughs> are you that this is a legitimate uh, image from deep within inside a burned Herculean scroll or carbonized I'm, Herculean I'm scroll. very confident, actually. So we had a sort of brainstorming uh, session yesterday with, uh, with Gianluca del Mastro and with other uh, paperologists that were in a symposium with us. Uh, and it was really exciting. We had the chance to read a lot of different words and to understand a little bit the syntax. So uh, we start to understand something about the uh, sentences there. Uh, of course, to understand the context we need something more from this column so from the top part of the lower part of the columns but still it, th this result is incredible here so I, I'm, I'm I very much want to read this text and I think I will work uh, on it also with the help of Gianluca del Mastro because uh, it, it also it's very nice to work in groups when you right. have uh, a papyrus to deal with and I have 
uh, fantastic opportunity to have uh, a great team of people that can help me uh, do that. I can, we can work together. So you know most of them. Yes, they're wonderful. <laughs> so Luke, um, what did you do Tuesday night when you, after you saw this? Yeah, so I saw this and I was like, it's like someone had broken the four minute mile. I'm like, this is possible. So um, I have just been working nonstop to both replicate and then you know surpass this with yeah. Yusef. Um, the grand prize is in sight. It's really exciting. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think I saw you leave the reception we had after the, the, our Italian friends arrived with like an armful of Diet Cokes. Yes, um, Because he was planning <laughs> to stay up all night and work on it. Um, so JP and Luke, uh, you believe you can read the rest of this scroll, right? Uh, once that is done, what, ha what happens next? I mean, the contest is over and that's the end? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, well, for, first, first of all, you know, the race is on now for the grand prize, right? Uh, just to reiterate, $700,000, if you think you can, you can uh, use these techniques to, to read everything, go and um, get, us, get us more columns, right? Like, the, they will be very happy with that. Uh, and then, of course, there's like hundreds of more, um, more scrolls um, that we have today that could be scanned um, you know at that point you know once once we get to to the point where we can really use these techniques uh, it all becomes uh, a matter of like scaling up these techniques and and at some point um, there might there might be more maybe um, you know maybe people can talk about how um, what we think might still be in the ground. Yeah, so the end of the contest is really just the beginning. Exactly, what you're exactly. So we're going to take some questions from our audience, both here, if you have a question, and also our audience that are watching um, on the live stream. And I do have a question, actually, um, about that exact thing. Um, are there more scans, I'm sorry, more scrolls still underground in the city of Herculaneum? that will be recovered and scanned. So who would like to answer that? Federica, maybe, maybe that would be a good okay. one for you. So this is actually a difficult question about the scrolls in the city of Herculaneum. So uh, the, the scrolls that we still haven't found. Uh, I think it is definitely possible that there are still um, scrolls in the, uh, in the ground. Uh, so I think it would be great to know more about that. Now that we know we have the technology to be able to read them, uh, what I can definitely d say is that we have uh, scrolls to be read in the library. Uh, we still have uh, about something between 400 and 600 uh, unopened items, unopened objects in the, uh, in the library. I say objects because uh, they can be intact scrolls but also fragments of scroll that haven't been opened so we have a lot of materials we can work on and having more of them from Herculaneum would be great of course. So are they still excavating um, in the city of Herculaneum or? In the city of Herculaneum yes not in the villa right now. Okay so the villa is the place where the uh, papyrus scrolls were located and were found so they're doing exactly. excavations elsewhere in Herculaneum, but not this particular place, where you think, or people think there might be more scrolls. There might be more scrolls. When yes. was the last time there was any excavation of that site? Does uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the this century. Okay, so we also have another question, um, actually from contestants, uh, or a potential contestant maybe. For those of us with coding background, but no experience with machine learning, are there roles we can help with? Like documentation or anything else? Yeah, that's a great question. So we haven't announced um, any any more prizes quite yet, but we are planning to. So if you look uh, look back at like the the progress prizes that we've had in the past, some of them are focused on machine learning. Others um, uh, have more to do with uh, computer graphics. Um, there's like all sorts of different things that. Um, yeah, that you can help out with, and we do intend, you know, with, without me saying exactly what the prizes are going to be uh, quite yet, but we do intend to have like fairly open-ended prizes going forward because um, there's just a lot of different things that need need to happen that all need to come together to be able to read a full scroll, and so we will need a lot of different techniques and uh, and so on. So, so stay tuned to scrollprize.org. Yeah, stay tuned. Get involved. So, Dr. Seals, I have a question for you. Um, uh, a few years ago, 2015, 2016, there were a couple of other papers that came out with some text from 
um, within a Herculaneum uh, papyrus scroll. So, so tell me how this is different from what those um, discoveries suggested. Yeah, that was a really interesting moment because we uh, we were able to, to see other groups uh, saying that they were reading Herculaneum, which was um, something that I always believed was possible. Uh, the 60 Minutes piece that uh, gave the project a lot of visibility kind of highlighted that moment. And in that piece, I, I said that you know the writing should be systematic, things should line up, you should be able to read it. Uh, I wasn't seeing that in the work of, of those colleagues at the time. But what I know to be true about this work is that it is, it, it is extremely systematic. And um, Stephen's PhD thesis uh, elaborates on the system that we are using to ensure that this is technically correct and that the papyrologists have no choice but to accept it as a legitimate and authentic text, because it is. Well. Okay. I, I would also like to add to that. We've done extremely thorough technical review on the on our side, on the prize side, uh, and we have a team of uh, six uh, papyrologists, including uh, Federica, uh, who have unanimously um, come to the conclusion that these letters are indeed what what, what we think they are. are. Yeah, indep so independently. Uh, Federica, so what does this mean for the field of papyrology, do you think? I mean, this is pretty exciting, and yeah. like I said, probably a lot of people don't know what papyrology is. What do you think this might do for your field? I think um, this will be a great revolution, uh, not only in the field of Herculaneum papyrology, but in papyrology in general, and also in the field of literary studies, because of course this will produce new texts. So this will be extremely important for all people, for all scholars interested in uh, uh, antiquity. Um, so I, I think that will be, will be a great breakthrough in, uh, in our field. What about, the, um, this is Greek, are all, someone asked from the audience, um, are they all Greek? There are also some Latin papyri. Okay. Um, the, also from a statistical point of view, we were probably expecting a Greek text because we find uh, much more uh, Greek texts than Latin in the uh, Herculaneum library. Uh, so, but th there are some Latin texts. The, the particular thing about the uh, Greek ones is that they are part of a, a specialized library, so a library uh, where we found, find uh, philosophical texts mostly connected to the Epicurean uh, school. And this could also be a part of that. So we think that this, is, this may be a philosophical text, probably an Epicurean text, and we will have the chance to confirm it, I hope, very, very soon. For Dr. Steele, someone wants to know how will the images be made available to the public? Uh, do you want to talk about that? Right now these images are uh, open through the contest, and the contest is, uh, is giving the data that is the foundation for this work uh, to any contestant who's willing to sign the agreement that we have in place. Um, it's unclear right now exactly how the images will be distributed ultimately to the public. We're probably going to embargo some of the images so that papyrologists can have a chance to, to analyze them and process them. Um, I want to acknowledge that we do have stakeholders who own this material and have so kindly allowed us to make images of them. And so I know that they are also very, very excited to see after their partnership with us that this is coming true, and so we'll be working with them on a framework for how we're going to disseminate the data. Someone would like to know um, what percentage of the papyrus is represented by Yusef's image here? Is there any way to guess? Yes, uh, we can calculate that. <laughs> I think so. Uh, we have portions of five columns, and we have six, seven partial lines in each of these columns. Usually in papyri, in Herculaneum papyri, we can find a number between mm, 150 and 200 something columns in each scroll. And in each column we can find a number of lines uh, from 30 to 40. So of course we can have much more text from, from this scroll. Did anyone in the audience here want to ask any questions? Yes, Ankan. Um, seeing use of scroll, what was the reaction first? I mean, what was the like first word that came to the mind of like Dr. Seals or anyone who saw the scroll, like Yusuf's output 
the first word that came to mind. So the question is, what's the first word that came to each one of you, your mind, when you saw this? Like the first, the first word that popped in your head when you saw this image. Probably the revolution or breakthrough, something like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was absolutely mind blowing. Mind blowing. Like <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't find the words. There weren't words. But uh, there were a lot of eyeballs on that. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it was pretty funny because as as the uh, people as we went around and showed the paparologists who had just arrived from Italy the image, it was a pretty interesting response. They immediately started trying to read it on these little cell phones. You know, it was pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Does my, anyone else have a question? But my word was already. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, uh, Sydney. So you guys have all been working on developing and refining this process of unrolling and reading these scrolls virtually. Do you plan to use that process on these scrolls outside of the Herculaneum set? So the question is, um, we've been developing tools just for Herculaneum. Is the, are there any plans to perhaps use these tools on other objects? These tools can be made to be more generic, that's for sure, and there is more material uh, in libraries and museums. When you put on these goggles that allow you to see damaged material with new eyes, you find that there are other really intriguing pieces of material that I do believe these techniques will uh, apply to. Um, and I can list off just a few. For example, the Franklin Papers, which are in a museum in London. And what are those exactly? Those are papers that were found from the Franklin Expedition, uh, the search for the Northwest Passage. And those papers, uh, which are, uh, were damaged in the Arctic, uh, and then found 200 years ago, 150 years ago, uh, have never been opened. So it's unclear what's written on those papers. Uh, virtual unwrapping might be the thing that could reveal it. So do you ever have people come to you from other libraries and museums who were like, I heard you're the man who can read the unreadable. Uh, can you take a look at my scroll I have in my collection? Or Increasingly, uh, that, that's been true. But I think after today, it will be very true. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Fish, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, this has been a process of almost two decades, uh, Professor Seals, uh, and you must have hit a low point or, or more than a low point along the way. What was that like and what kept you going to, to come to this point? There are always low points. Um, as my math professor used to say, you know, there's always a minimum and a maximum, you know, in any set, right? <laughs> So it doesn't matter how high you go, right? There's always one that's lower, right? So the low points uh, created in me uh, a, a kind of durability, and I think that's what's good about facing challenge. Um, and I think also in people who observe that, it creates a belief that um, that, that passion is real. We heard earlier from the paparologists where they talk about assigning a Pap, uh, a piece of papyrus to a, a junior papyrologist to work on. And they described it as seeing if there was fire. What was the Italian word? It was uh, poco sacro. Which means sacred fire. sacred fire, right? When you see that in a student, you know they're ready, right? And so what those low moments do, Jeff, is that they create the sacred fire. Okay? <laughs> We have another question from our home audience. Um, they want to know what is the, this wavy line? Do, do you guys want to explain what that is? Do you? Yeah, so those are artifacts from the virtual unwrapping process. So you take the kind of spiral, it's almost like a piece of toilet paper, and you try to isolate the individual squares. But you know, it's burned, it's crumpled, there's all these problems. And this is basically about as much as we've been able to extract so far. But we're trying to get more. So these these waves exactly that's like the roll the wraps basically yes you would rep it represents kind of the wraps um, the other question I think Dr. Seals maybe you can answer is is it really possible we love that question is it really possible to penetrate and reveal text all the way to the center layer of the scrolls tomography is kind of magical and when I first learned about it. Um, you know, when you go to the doctor, they're able to see inside you non-invasively, um, no surgery, and then they can tell all kinds of things about your anatomy. Same technology here. Uh, the, the tomographic idea was uh, awarded a Nobel Prize in 1979 and has continued to develop with all kinds of applications, including non-destructive evaluation for parts that go into spacecraft, for example. And so 
yes, it's absolutely possible to see everything about the internal structure, and it doesn't really matter the depth in this case. Everything through the entire uh, volume of a scroll is seen and measured by tomography. Can you th anyone else before we wrap up? Because I do think that's a really great, great place to wrap up. I mean, um, we have a quote that we use from uh, Walt Disney that says something like, "I like being, I like, um, I like the impossible or trying the impossible because there's fewer people there in that space or whatever." And um, as everyone knows, here at the University of Kentucky, we do things that are wildly possible, right? So this is obviously an example of the wildly possible things, or the impossible things that UK can make wildly possible with our partnerships uh, with the Institut de France, with our partnerships with uh, wonderful technical geniuses like the Vesuvius Prize has brought to us. And I just want to thank everyone for being here today and participating in this event. And um, we will have much more to come, I'm sure. Thank you.